It's a pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Um, this is Dr. Elizabeth Newman, and her the title of her presentation, When Art and Science Collide Towards a Political Philosophy of Humanized Birth. She is a senior lecturer in midwifery at the University of Newcastle. Her 20-year career includes midwifery practice, advocacy, teaching, and research. She has widely she has published widely in both academic and practice journals and been invited to speak at conferences and events. The lead author of Towards the Humanization of Birth, a study of epidural, analgesial, and hospital birth culture, published by Paul Grave Macmillan in 2018. Key areas of study are birth culture and environment, midwifery practice to support birth physiology, maternity policy, politics and technologies, and care ethics. It is such a great pleasure to learn from you today, Liz. Thank you for being here. And I'm just going to hand over the presentation to you. Thanks, Red. And That's thanks so you. much You're to welcome. Thank you. And thanks, our Virtual International Day of the Midwife, for for having me oh you've gone red completely remind me how i yeah, do this so i go you. full screen okay, hang sorry. on yeah, full screen do, application you... is that what i do mm -hmm. you can I think do. so you should see the, yeah. the arrows there to control your slides. that's good yeah thanks yeah. celine okay. for the loving the title i was quite happy when i came up with that as well so yeah the conference this year is about the midwifery art and science and as i was um you know, putting together the talk, it really kind of came together as I was um, thinking about what I might talk about when I was invited to, to come and talk to this conference. So I'm really pleased to be here. And yeah, thanks for having me. And I, so I'll just jump straight into it. I just want to acknowledge that I'm sitting on the lands of the Ghana people and um, the traditional custodians of the lands on which I'm seated. And I want to pay my respect to elders past and present and pay my respects to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people in the world today in the in the room. So what I'm going to talk about today is why a political philosophy of birth and I did think um, it might put some people off, you know, um, that whole kind of theory thing can be a little bit daunting or some people find it boring even, but um, I just think it's fascinating and really important. And I'm going to talk about that during the, the course of this talk. And I'm going to talk about the science of knowledge production and its effect on the art of midwifery practice. So that's where the collision happens. And then talk a little bit about this concept of the paradox of the institution. Um, then a little bit about um, this idea of rhetorical informed consent and how that contributes to dehumanised care. And then coming up with a, a bit of a solution, which is to focus on care ethics and relationality. So some of this stuff, and lots of you would may have seen this already, but um, is cut so that my PhD was published as the book towards the humanisation of birth. And I was also invited to do a series of um, articles for the practicing midwife to kind of, you know, distill that down a bit and and try and interpret that for practice in a in a more kind of useful way, I suppose. So they're available anyway. And why am I talking about political philosophy, you know, in a midwifery conference? Um, and I think from this this 20 years, you know, and it is actually my 20th year of um, of practice, I realised. So, um, you know, I've really come to realise that we have to attend to these kinds of knowledges, political and ph philosophical, as much as we do to other kinds of analyses. And we've gotten really good at some of the other kinds of analyses. You know, we do systematic reviews, we do clinical evaluations, and I'm talking about midwifery here as a field, but we've done less of this other kind of work, um, generally speaking. I mean, I know it's out there, but it's just not around as much. So I'm going to touch on Foucault a little bit as I, as I go through this um, presentation. And 
um, so, you know, Foucault kind of talked about philosophy as being a practice of politics. And in essence, it's a truth telling in relation to power. So we don't just kind of talk about what's happening or think about what's happening. You know, if we use philosophy, we can actually shape what's happening around us in the world by questioning, contesting and understanding the kind of truths that we have around us. Why is this important? And I don't really need to say this to probably anyone in this room. We know that it, birth trauma rates are going up. We know that obstetric violence reports are going up. We know that suicide is a leading cause of maternal mortality. And, you know, these are problems that we're facing all over the world. And at the same time, there have been, you know, mechanisms to try and reduce this kind of behaviour. So the, um, the Rehuna there on the left, is the was the humanization of birth network in brazil that started i mean in the 90s and you know the humanizing birth movement has been growing since then and really that was a a kind of antidote to obstetric violence um so and at the same time the world health organization is publishing position papers on elimination of disrespect and abuse, we've got human rights in childbirth, we've got reproductive justice movement, um, and this has been going on at the same time, and yet we're still seeing these increased rates. So, you know, there's something else going on here. And that's where, you know, this kind of idea of the, the science and art colliding comes in. Again, I'm just going to talk very quickly about some, some simple kind of philosophical building blocks, I suppose, before I go into the, the, the more interesting <laughs> bits about how it affects midwifery practice. But just to, just to kind of set it up, Foucault talked about power um, as being a productive force. So it wasn't just this kind of pr oppressive thing that came down and, you know, uh, told people what to do. It's productive. So, uh, and its main area of production is in the gathering and the storing of knowledge. And this is how power is, is created and, and maintained. It's also localised. So he talks about techniques of power in institutions and between individuals. And the good thing about that is that every opportunity then is an opportunity for resistance. You know, it, every interaction with every person is an opportunity to think about power interactions. Um, but um, so this gathering and storing of knowledge is a kind of surveillance technique that um, hospitals and prisons and schools and other social institutions um, sort of contribute to creating these um, these kind of techniques of power that then are used to govern behaviour of populations. So if you just see that last little quote, to structure the possible fields of action of others, and this is what governance does. So at some point in this whole process, they don't even really need to govern because people are already busy governing themselves because we know what it means to be a good student or a good patient. Um, and so these ideas about um, the way we need to behave become self-fulfilling. The other thing, the other point I suppose I want to talk about is genealogy. So um, Foucault disrupted the idea that we're on this kind of path to progress, which was very much um, the kind of uh, I suppose the ideas that came out of the enlightenment in the scientific discourse was to say, you know, we're finding our way to this end point where we're going to know everything and it's going to be great. But Foucault says, nah, you know, we're not on this pro path to progress. We're actually just sitting in this constant struggle of knowledge. Um, and whichever knowledge creates itself as dominant, 
seems self-evident. So it feels like um, it's just how things are, you know, the status quo, this is what happens. You have a baby, you go to hospital, you're going to be induced, blah, blah, blah. And, and it becomes less feasible to resist these kind of practices because they become common sense. And in this way, the problem for us is the more self-evident medicalized birth becomes, the less other ways of birthing seem possible or acceptable. And I think we're seeing that a little bit now. I mean, it's always been there, but. So dominant discourses recreate themselves using this power knowledge kind of paradigm. And what that creates is history. It creates thought, it creates action. It creates the truth of our age. For example, it's safe to give birth in a hospital is one of those. And then if you have a radical or a dissenting view, then um, you're not only denied access to the dominant discourse, but you're opposed and you're often discounted as kind of dangerous or foolish, often. So medicine is a current dominant discourse. It's part of um, the general kind of politics of what, of the truth of childbirth. You know, it creates norms, it creates rules, it creates ideas about what's safe and what's risky. And part of the reason that medicine could align itself in this way is because, you know, because of the history. And again, we're going to go back to that kind of patriarchal status driven thing. Um, because it was educated men, mostly, uh, medicine aligned itself with science and technology, even though it wasn't particularly scientific, you know, in this in the 18th century, for example. It's also aligned with government. So the government was started to become concerned with the surveillance of populations. And so medicine was able to support that. So they supported each other. And as religion declined as a kind of institution of social control or social understanding, um, medis, um, medicine came in and replaced that. So you can see the medicalization of sexuality and drug use and, and areas that used to be uh, much more under the kind of umbrella of the church. So if we, th if we take all this as kind of foundational, then uh, Foucault would also say, we don't need to think about the medicalization of birth as the problem itself, but we need to think about what does the medicalization serve? What purpose does it serve? Why does it happen? You know, who's interested in it? And to understand that, we need to just briefly sort of understand that um, reproductive power is, um, or reproductive issues are really a powerful piece of knowledge. So midwives would know about live and still births. They would know about who was trying to access abortion. They would know about paternity. They would know, um, which, you know, kind of identifies property rights and things like that. Really powerful information. Midwifery power has been challenged by um, the church, the state, medical and nursing professions over the last sort of three or 400 years in the Western European tradition, at least. Um, and again, I'll go back to that idea that hospital birth is safe. When hospitals first came, were introduced, um, they were definitely not safer. They had very high mortality rates. They were convenient for doctors. They were convenient for the state. And yet we have this ongoing belief that hospitals are the safest place to give birth, um, which is actually not based in any evidence whatsoever. And, and the, the brilliant midwifery research that's coming out now is saying actually probably not the safest place to have a baby. Also in Africa, Letitia, yeah. And that, a lot of that is colonization as well. So other influences, and there are many other influences, 
but one of the important ones is techno-rationalism, which I'll just briefly describe. Um, so it's this idea that scientific advance is progress. And remember Foucault said actually progress isn't real. It's only ever the struggle for knowledge. But scientific advance equals progress and progress equals moral good. So there's this real kind of morality involved with um, science, science and technology. It also has an implied effectiveness of technological intervention. So if there's machinery involved, then you um, then it's got to be better. This is and the perfect example of this is our CTG. And the same with the next point, the complex over the mundane. So the CTG is seen as more effective than a midwife in the room with a Doppler or a Pinards, um, even though it's probably not more effective. I'd say definitely not more effective. The technological imperative means just because the technology is there, we think we have to use it. And again, <laughs> CTG springs to mind, but there are others. Um, and the prevention of abstract risk rather than the avoidance of a specific danger. And this is quite important to remember um, because it takes away the focus from the individual and it moves it to the abstract. And so the other thing that Foucault says about discourse is that all we really have to do to find out where the dominant discourse of the day is, is to look at practice. And, you know, this idea of thought as social practice. So if we look at current maternity practices around the world, we can see where the dominant discourse is. And this picture on this slide was just, I just snapped it from Twitter the other month during a, um, the All Island Midwifery Forum. And that's the brilliant Mary Brosnan there from the National Maternity Hospital um, presenting, you know, and in a, in a kind of, you know, a shocked sort of way that more first time mothers will be induced or have a baby by pre labor caesarean than will present in spontaneous labor. And I mean, that's just a snapshot. And I pulled it off because, you know, I saw it. But this is happening everywhere. And it is a real problem. I mean, it is a massive issue. We have no idea what we're doing. Um, and we've never been at this stage before in reproductive history. So, um, yeah, so plainly we can see the dominant discourse that's operating. Um, and just so that you know that I'm not making this up, <laughs> um, I have got a paper about this, which was written some time ago, but it was about um, uh, the Australian government tried to introduce some policy that would give midwives more autonomy and more scope. And the medical system um, vehemently opposed it and they um, put in submissions about why obstetrics was rational, safe and aligned with progress and why midwifery was dangerous, dangerous, ideological and needing supervision. And in their first page of their submission, they talked about mothers and babies dying if, midwif if midwives were given more scope. So really interesting there. They also use other kinds of language. So they talked about the government changes being interventionist, which kind of draws on neoliberal you know, freedom of the market kind of um, discourse. They appealed to the to the women's right to choose, but around epidural and cesarean section, and they talked about the pressure. They'd be they were worried that people would be pressured into a normal birth if midwives were given more scope. And they made this whole argument on really minimal, out of date, and poor quality evidence. So you can read about that if you want. And that leads to this, uh, what I'm gonna talk about, the, the science of knowledge production. Um, again, it's about discourse and the way that we create truth. So this is about epidural analgesia. And some of you might've seen 
me talk about various elements of this because what I've done here is kind of pulled together all of the threads of, you know, what I've been doing the last few years and it kind of makes this story. But anyway, my apologies if you've seen bits of this before, but um, there's a little quote there on the front which came from a, a journal article, a scientific journal article about epidural analgesia. So that's quite, I'm hoping you can all read, read it, but um, it's fairly telling, you know, this, it's very techno rationalist, wouldn't you say? It's like, you know, part of the modern Western lifestyle. So then, um, part of this knowledge production thing. So this is some of the work for my PhD. And I did a critical review of epidural analgesia. So I didn't focus so much on the outcomes, although I reported on them. You know, I did talk about what the impact was of an epidural, but I was mainly looking for the, the assumptions behind what they were saying, you know. So, um, part of that critical analysis is looking at what's kind of being said, while well, even though they're trying to be unbiased and scientific. All of the papers, nearly all of them, introduced epidural analgesia as a gold standard analgesia, which I mean, it probably is in the, in the sense that it works quite well and it's um, safer than a general anaesthetic, you know. Um, they also talked about uh, labour pain as being the worst pain that women will ever go through in their lives. So that was really at the front of, you know, in the first opening paragraph of these scientific papers. So then um, pain relief was constructed as paramount, as, as absolutely necessary. Um, as it was kind of like their duty to relieve this dreadful pain and that it was nearly a human right. Pain relief was also equated to progress. So, which then meant that if you don't want to relieve pain, you're kind of absurd or weird or archaic or some kind of, you know, living in a cave hippie. So, um, and you can see there the discourse in action. Um, there was an emphasis on the abnormality of labour pain. So it, um, it created that as a kind of, yeah, this terrible thing that had to be, had to kind of rescue people from. Um, but it normalised technological intervention and did not ever talk about the pain of the intervention. So there was a really old paper that's got you know, the outcomes have got no relevance to today because it, it was related to a higher caesarean section rate, which there doesn't seem to be an equation there anymore um, because the blocks are lighter. Although in practice, it's arguable because it, it looks like it leads to caesarean section a lot more, but uh, according to the, the evidence, it doesn't. But anyway, what these authors were saying was that the higher rates of cesarean section or instrumental birth were probably acceptable to women because uh, at least it got rid of their labour pain. So really bizarre ways of looking at pain, especially when you think about the pain of cesarean scars or post-op recovery or episiotomies and, and trying to recover from those. And it definitely ignored the positive and purposeful aspects of labour pain. So when we finally got around to actually asking people what they thought about labour pain, um, they described it in, people describe it in positive terms. It's powerful, it's joyful, potentially, you know, not everybody, but, but certainly strongly. Um, there's a connection to the baby that um, the most important thing in labour is actually support, not pain. And um, that needing pain relief might actually come from fear or lack of control or lack of support rather than pain itself. So that's the kind of flip side to, to what the epidural literature was saying.
Um, okay, so I mean, we all know why you may not want to have an epidural. <laughs> um, main reason now, I suppose, is risk of instrumental birth, but also other risks. It doesn't necessarily increase birth satisfaction, which is interesting because if it actually doesn't do that, why would we be kind of saying that this is a good choice to make? Um, we know that satisfaction with birth experience is not necessarily related to pain and it's multifaceted. And so really when we think about it like that, then uh, the discourse about epidural as human right and a rescue uh, kind of gets turned on its head and it's potentially an unnecessary intervention, definitely not well explained to women and birthing people about what the risks are. And it may not even relieve their suffering. It may give them more suffering and it might decrease joy in birth or the possibility of joy because of the impact on the hormones. Yes, yeah, so much for God's standard. So then I did this other paper here and um, uh, this was about the language used in the pamphlets about water birth compared to the information that was given about epidural analgesia. Thanks, Lena. <laughs> um, and essentially the, the language that was talking about water birth in this particular site was all about risk and restriction and danger. So it was, you must, you can't, you know, this is really dangerous. You have to sign this in front of a midwife while you're still pregnant. And the epidural information is very much about access, safety, and uh, you could sign it whenever, you know, potentially after the epidural had gone in, in labor. So really different ways of framing these two practices, even though you can get in a bath at home, you know, without any <laughs> aseptic technique or anesthetic support. Um, so, when you look at them side by side, of course, getting in a bath is much less risky than having an epidural. But it was not being presented like that. So this again is this concept of risk discourse. It's much broader than medicine. It's part of our social kind of way of being. Now there's a, a few key theorists that talk about risk discourse and it's, um, yeah, it's bigger than medicine. But when we bring it down to, to a medical setting, um, it's really abstract and inexact. We can't say, you know, if there's a one in 10,000 chance of this happening, we can't tell if the, you know, if the woman sitting in front of us is that one in 10,000. It really leads to a lack of individualization. It leads to blanket policies that encourage over medicalization. Uh, you know, it, again, it focuses on technology. It's quite practitioner centred. It's about litigation. And therefore it reproduces these power relationships. And obstetric risk discourse in particular creates certain practices as risky and others as safe, as I've just shown in that last paper. Medical practices tend not to be seen as creating risk. So for example, in my research, induction was not really seen as a risky practice. Uh, and there's, a, you know, there's an example of that, I won't go into it, but um, we can see it, we can see that in the, in the stats that I kind of had a few slides ago. We are inducing women and birthing people at an alarming rate. Um, you know, it's going up to 50% and over. Um, the other thing about obstetric risk discourse is it's blind to iatrogenic risk. So it doesn't see the risks that it presents in its own interventions. And it's influenced by these other discourses like techno-rationalism. So rejection of technology is seen as risky, even though it might be absolutely justified. And the other thing to keep in mind is it's not evidence-based at all, mostly, you know, as a, as a kind of general rule, it's not about evidence, it's about creating this kind of power knowledge 
uh, discourse. So then I thought about, um, you know, this hospital system that I was studying. And uh, what I want to talk about here, and it all links together, and I'm hoping this is kind of clear, <laughs> I'm not, um, you know, rambling about too much, but essentially, if you see on this left hand side, organisational technology, I've termed it because Foucault uses the terms uh, technologies of power or techniques of power. So it's about how our practice is organised to maintain the status quo in particular institutions. So the organisational technology um, used institutional surveillance. So remember we talked about surveillance as being a part of the power knowledge collection, you know, that collection of information about people leads to a power knowledge situation. So the way that they would do this is to, well, an example is for our EVEs um, or the kind of, I don't know how many of you have seen like the kind of labour board boards that have got, you know, everyone's name on it and you know how dilated everybody is and this kind of overarching surveillance which is not really for the benefit of the woman, it's for the benefit of the institution. And what happens then, if you see this other arrow that's going up, institutional momentum. So then what would happen is, okay, so that woman's not laboring fast enough. Let's get the Sinto up. Or the, the labor ward's filling up, so let's get somebody, you know, to have a baby so we can get them out and get the next person in. So what that actually did, that surveillance paradoxically, was increase risk for the women by, by medicalizing the birth space. Um, thanks Richard, I'm just caught that little chat there. Then the midwifery technology on the other side was again paradoxical and that's why I've called this concept the paradox of the institution because the midwives were kind of like positioned as the people that had to take care of normal birth. So um, they, you know, there was kind of this banter about, well, you're a midwife, you know, go in there and don't come out till you've had a baby. I mean, whoever's worked in the hospital may have, um, have, I'm getting distracted by the chat, <laughs> may have, um, I uh, heard that before, you know, it's like, you know, we're the experts of normal and that that's not kind of, that's incorporated into this process. Okay, midwife, if you're a guardian of the normal, go in there and get me out a baby. This is, you know, the obstetric banter. But then at the same time, midwifery practice is constructed as risky, this other arrow going up. So, Midwives are tasked with this protecting physiology and yet every single practice that they need to pull out to, to support physiology, they're not able to do in that system or it's very difficult or there's a great resistance or it's kind of ridiculed and, um, you know, um, not really seen as uh, beneficial. So, Oh, I've got 10 minutes. I'm getting there. <laughs> Thank you. So there's this paradox whereby um, things that are meant to keep women safe increase risk and the things that are meant to guard normal birth are not able to happen. Um, which led me then to, to see how, and this, this paper here, was about how midwives talk about epidural use in antenatal classes, which was kind of, um, you, it's your body, this is great, physiological birth is fabulous, um, but, you know, and then the caveats would come, hospital policy says this, um, you know, it's really hard to get in the water and so on, which made me really think about how can we talk about informed consent when everything from the, from the main discourse in the scientific literature down through policy, down to what the midwives are saying, 
is kind of skewed in this institutional paradox way or this risk safety paradox way where safe practices are um, described as risky and risky practices are described as safe. So then I wrote a paper with Mavis Kirkham about this where we talked about the problem of uh, informed consent being essentially baseless or rhetorical because it's not actually happening, um, which took us then to care ethics. Um, so care ethics is a really useful way of looking at this problem because it pr gives primacy to the relationship. Um, that's the main thing I'll say because I'm, I need to sort of get through the rest of this, but um, uh, it does see care as a political practice, which is important because care, it's then care isn't just about um, that some people do for others, you know, mothers and babies, midwives, nurses, everybody needs care, everybody receives care, everybody at some point will give care. It's a political practice um, that we, that human beings do. Um, so again, the problem with autonomy is, is um, the fact that it's kind of coming from this old colonizing kind of patriarchal thing that said, you know, we're all equal and we're all liberal individual humans, but that really was only white men of particular means. Not everybody else was actually autonomous, which means that bodily self-determination in places like hospitals, and we see this in birth outcomes with black and brown women in the UK and Aboriginal women here having much worse outcomes because of these um, uh, prejudices. So autonomy is a problematic concept, actually. So some of us are saying, actually, obstetric violence is a problem of relationality rather than a problem of autonomy. Let's move this conversation forward. How do we give um, a relationship-based care in a system that is standardised and fragmented. And again, this is coming back to care ethics. Um, and I want to just bring out, bring your thoughts back to the, the abstractness of the risk discourse. Abstract theory is a problem for relational care. So bioethical principles are abstract. We can morally detach ourselves and that's how dehumanising practices like coercion and non-consent can happen. If we put the relationship back in, then it's much harder for that to occur. So it's a key to providing ethical care and I'm going to focus on attentiveness if I've got time. <laughs> um, so attention is an act of knowing and an act of love. We need to talk more about love in midwifery. We barely talk about it at all. Um, and this act of attention, of giving someone your attention, enables them, according to Sarah Ruddick, to let otherness be. We can let, or, you know, we don't let women do anything, but we can, um, we can sit with women and birthing people's decisions when they don't align with caregiver protocol or time restriction, if we, um, if we just change our focus to attention, to attentiveness and relationality. Um, violence and coercive behaviours can't happen when you're paying attention with knowingness and love. So identifying care as a political practice is part of care ethics. It's, it's as central to human life and it's a mechanism of resistance to dehumanising systems which rely on abstraction and separation. So instead we're bringing it back to complexity, contextuality and human connection. Um, and then I was just going to bring this quickly back to research because, um, you know, and I suppose back to this idea of a political philosophy we need to be thinking about theory. We need to be thinking about qualitative research, creativity, 
and you know thinking of research in these deep reflective ways not just systematic kind of quantitative ways i think it's crucial to midwifery and birth especially where we're at oh my god three minutes critical midwifery studies i just want to acknowledge that there's lots of people doing things in this space inga van nisselroy is um uh introduced me to that sarah ruddick piece i'm gonna just go to the end this is a crucial issue it's it's absolutely um with it's unprecedented and we think it's the same as climate change and that's my <laughs> final slide why do we want a political philosophy i'll let you read that there do you want to have we got time for a question We have, um, thank you, Liz, we have two minutes um, <laughs> to be out of the room. So we can run through, um, we can run through the chat and see what we have here. There was a few questions. There was so much resounding love for your presentation and how much you've put everything um, together, the red threads that you've, you've brought in. Um, thank you. So so let's start at the bottom here from Annabelle. It says, so Liz, does it come back to genealogy? Um, as Foucault suggests to deconstruct the patriarchal paradigms and reconstruct ethics of care. Ah, oh, yes, you said that. Uh, and then she said, ah, <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that's part of it. I think there's... Yeah, there are lots of kind of threads to this. And I suppose what I'm trying to do is bring some of this thinking into the midwifery space. And like, I saw your question, Joe, about how do we do this without pulling out for go, <laughs> All right? I think we can do that, you know, and the, and the, um, the papers that I wrote for the practicing midwife, I really tried to just, you know, de-philosophize it. But I suppose the point I'm trying to make is actually we can bring this in and have those and have those conversations. And I think we need to bring the philosophy in actually. Maybe not with women and people and community, but we need to understand how these bigger kind of structures are working so that we can actually resist them in a way that is going to be effective because we know what the evidence is. You know, we know that these practices are happening. We know that there's there are real problems. So how can we address it in a way that is has kind of got a strong foundation and a strong argument so that we can really make change? Um, and this is just one way of doing it. You know, this is one person's thought, but I just think we can pull it all together somehow and support each other to change the world, really. <laughs> Thank you, Liz, for being you and for helping us to change the world. I learned so <laughs> much you. from you today, and I feel like I need to listen to this presentation about five times. Um, and yeah, we need you and your work so much in the world. So I'm so grateful for you. It's been such a great conversation. I know that we could we could do another 30 minutes easily, another hour really easily. Um, and I am going to wrap us up now with the